we have the honor of having Shirley Higuchi, the author of Setsuko's Secret, uh, joining us, along with two of her friends to share their perspectives. You know, we have a, a lot to cover, so let's get started by showing a three-minute book trailer before we invite Shirley on screen. So let's show the book trailer. <laughs> trailer. Um, so Shirley, why don't you uh, come join me on the screen while I introduce you. Uh, Shirley Ann Higuchi is the author of Setsuko's Secret, Heart Mountain and the Legacy of the Japanese American Incarceration. Um, you know, I've known Shirley for about 10 years and I've known you as the chair of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. And for those of you who aren't aware, Heart Mountain is the Wyoming concentration camp where over 10,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated, including Shirley's parents, Dr. William Higuchi and the late Setsuko Saito Higuchi. You know, Shirley became a lawyer in part because of her discomfort with how the legal system treated her parents and their families. After graduating from the Georgetown University Law Center, she was an attorney for the Washington firm of Epstein Becker Green before leaving to head the legal advocacy office of the American Psychological Association. She is the past president of the District of Columbia Bar and is a member of the Federal Law Enforcement Nominating Commission appointed by Re Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton. So Shirley, I, I really enjoyed reading the book and I was struck by how you came into your work at Heart Mountain and the role your mother played. So as a starting point, why don't you share how this came about and how it culminated into the writing of this book. Well, thanks, Tom, and, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate everyone's interest in this topic, um, and I think it has a huge impact 
um, on the community in Seattle, given uh, how many Japanese Americans um, ended up there. But um, when you, you know, the book itself, a lot of the information in terms of the genesis of this book really is in the first uh, chapter as well as the inside flap cover of the book. And it all sort of came about in 2005 uh, when my mother, uh, Satsuko, was dying of pancreatic cancer. And we were all sort of shocked and surprised on her deathbed that she wanted her code in to go to Heart Mountain. And we were completely stunned by that. I mean, we really didn't realize what the impact was. Well, what happened was, is that right after she died, uh, some of the organizers at Heart Mountain this, at the site, they aren't Japanese American, they're all Caucasian uh, leaders that, that live in Wyoming, wanted me to come out or wanted my family to come out to a dedication in her honor. And we were all kind of looking at each other and saying, you know, what's Heart Mountain? Why would they want us to go out there? And in some ways, you know, because if I think of, you know, again, that Japanese American sort of upbringing, like every Japanese American, I got suspicious. Like, what, why do they want me to come out to Wyoming? What is this? And sort of at the last minute, um, I decided to go. My brothers didn't want to go. My dad did not want to go either. And I decided to go on my own to a place I had never been before. And, you know, that's a little overwhelming because it's not an easy flight from Washington, D.C., so um, I ended up uh, going, my son, thank God, went with me and we took a jumper flight from Salt Lake to Cody and we rented a car. And the feeling of power of place, you know, arriving at that site and seeing a sea of individuals. At that time, I, I really got to know Secretary Mineta, much better, Norman Mineta, who was incarcerated at Heart Mountain. And uh, he's a character in my book. And I also met Alan Simpson and learn more about their friendship and their background. And I also had the opportunity to meet Bill Hosakawa, who was also there, um, former editor of the Denver Post, who was also um, editor of the Heart Mountain Sentinel, which, you know, Tom, you know a lot about because, uh, you know, we recorded or they record a lot of the events while they were incarcerated. So that's sort of the, the beginning of the journey and um, how I sort of came about, you know, learning more and wanting to write this book. And, and Shirley, let me interrupt just, you know, you talked about some of the people. You know, I've been to Heart Mountain and, and it's a, a pretty stark place. What, what physically did you feel when you first got there and recognized where you were? And what were your first impressions of Heart Mountain? Well, I think the first impression, and this is 2005, so I, things have changed a little bit, you know, during the years. But they did have the roll call there, you know, where the memorial was erected for all those brave young men who fought on behalf of the United States. And there were also original barracks still on site, um, the hospital barrack and the chimney. So I think it was more of the ability to feel kind of the um, trauma and the incarceration that took place in 1942 by the visuals and the landscape and the beauty of Heart Mountain. Um, but of course, the museum wasn't built then. But it was the overwhelming aspect, I think, was seeing all the Nisei that actually showed up because it was Heart Mountain and the children of the Nisei. And I think the impact of seeing both the communities, the white communities, and Cody and Paul to come out to support the Simpson family, um, who were part of the process as well. So I think it was the people that filled the space that had become barren at, during the years. Right. And, and when you think of, um, or, or I guess, so you, you, you got in there, you felt this, but it ultimately culminated in writing a book. How did you make the, the jump from, you know, really, you know, just being, you know, the chairman of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation to writing this book? Well, that, that's a really uh, good question. And it, it really um, had to do with my journey. Um, I did come onto the board uh, around 2007. And at that time, uh, Doug Nelson, our vice chair, is the person that nominated me to become chair of the organization. And you could imagine from a political standpoint how that might have gone over with the Japanese American community as well as the Caucasian white community, given the fact that I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I wasn't embedded in the JA community. 
And as you could know, as you probably know from your experiences, you know, the JA community has a lot of complexities and its own hierarchical uh, way of approaching things. So um, I think in some ways the nomination was a shock to the Japanese American community who had been around Heart Mountain for a while, but it also was, I think, a shock to the, the Caucasian community. Um, so in that respect, at that point, when I did step into those shoes, it did take me a bit to adjust to what was going on. It was very overwhelming. But then I started meeting more and more Nisei and I attended and was engaged in the pilgrimages. I met people on site, both in Cody and Powell and in the community and got to know Secretary Mineta, Judge Raymond Uno, Bacon Sakatani, Daryl Kunitomi's family and others so that I knew that this was gonna be a place of significance that I needed to start documenting. So a, a person that's working with you now, now Hannah Mariyama was one of my first um, um, assistants who really began documenting a lot of work with me. And then um, after that, Helen Yoshida was involved and now Julie, but it was a point of documenting and interviewing all the Nisei and all the community members I met along the way. Cause I knew at some point this had to be a book. I just didn't know what it would look like. Mm. And, and so in many ways, the, the book is documenting kind of the, the, the journey you went from, you know, the moment you found out about, you know, from your mother, you go there and then these amazing people that you met along this journey. And, and that's, you know, the, the, the book. Yes, you know, something that um, you know, really str uh, strikes me about you, um, so we've known each other for about 10 years and, and you really um, came onto the scene in a really, I think, powerful way. And, you know, I've worked with many individuals um, who have worked to preserve and share the World War II Japanese American uh, experience. And it's really interesting to me to see how a person's background influences the role they play in this work. You know, for example, you know, my Seattle Japanese American community roots and high tech background you know, very much influences my work at Den Show. So I'm very much about, you know, collecting the stories of, you know, many of the people in our community and using technology to, to make it available. So I'm really curious for you, um, how your background, you know, working in the Beltway, you're a DC lawyer, you're well connected, you were a past president of the DC, you know, bar. And so this gives you another unique perspective into, you know, what, for how you see the community, the World War II experience, and the role that you could play? Well, that's a very, very good question. And it's, it's a very complex one in many ways. I think um, one of the benefits, Tom, that you have had, as you've expressed to me, is that you had the a benefit to being exposed to the Japanese American community while you were growing up to a certain degree. And you also had the ability to work for a, a wonderful uh, company um, and gain, you know, really extensive experience that allowed you to take that experience and then to benefit by telling the Japanese American story through Densho. My process probably one, wasn't as linear as yours because as my book reflects, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where there were essentially no Japanese American and very little Asians. I remember having one Asian friend and she was a Korean um, um, musician that were that was transplanted from Korea and, and actually English was a second language. But besides that, all my friends were were black and white. So it never occurred to me to ever jump into the Japanese American community and be a leader. It wasn't in the books for me. What was in the books for me, I think, was to um, operate in a very highly assimilated way in Washington, DC. Many of my colleagues and supporters are African American and white people. Um, and I learned very well to always maneuver myself in a black and white environment and excel in a black and white environment. But honestly, I was the only Asian, at least in the early years, who uh, gained you know, positions with the judiciary as well as with the DC bar. But it brought me a very, very, very important skill that really helped me become a leader at Heart Mountain that I knew how to work with various communities. I mean, to really be able to work with the Cody and Powell Wyoming community, and this is a red state, right? They're all Republicans. And then be able to satisfy, you know, the Japanese Americans on the West Coast in LA, in Washington state, et cetera, et cetera, 
who many are, you know, Democrat and very liberal, but there's also a pretty conservative bent with the Japanese American community as well. I had already been trained to be able to work in that environment. And I'm also looking at ways to bring in the African American community to tell the story. And I'm in the process of doing that now with the judiciary. Um, but um, I think what it was really, honestly, is my mother's death and her deathbed wish is what opened my ability to enter into the Japanese American community. Because as you know, um, our Nisei mothers really didn't ask for much. They didn't need much because what was important to the Nisei mothers was making sure that their children like you and I were successful and protected and supported and well-fed and well-clothed. And so they had very little needs. But when I found out that this was something that my mother wished for, it gave me the opportunity to step into her shoes and give her what she wanted that she couldn't fulfill in her lifetime. Great answer. So I wanna do one more question before we bring the other two on. And, and, and that is, what surprises um, you know, have you had since you've come out with a book or, or even your work in the community. You know, you, you talk about you know, being kind of an you know, outsider in some ways. You didn't see yourself as someone who you know, was slated to be a leader in the Japanese American community, but you know, your work, you, you've become a leader. And I'm just curious in terms of either the book or your work, what, what surprises have, have you had? I think the most emotional revealing surprise that I've had was really the deep history that a lot of the characters in the book had. It was really easy, you know, in the early days to look at, for instance, Taku Shizaki, one of the resistors, and just see him as a resistor and not really appreciating that he's more than that. He's a PhD biologist. He's studying in Antarctica. He's just an amazing person. And all the different stories and varied histories of all the Niseis that I met throughout my lifetime um, in those surprises. I learned more about the relationship between Senator Simpson and Mormonetta and how deeply rooted that friendship is. And yes, you know, you could be a Republican and Democrat and you could work across the aisle. But I think the biggest surprise that's in the uh, prologue, the ending, uh, the beginning and the epilogue in my book is really what the impact was on the Japanese American community and how there was transgenerational effects that passed along to me as well as other family members. We always just didn't really understand any of that. And um, it's really appreciating the Japanese American incarceration in realizing that part of the healing is learning more and as much as we can. And that's why Densho is so valuable along with Heart Mountain being a site, but also then using that experience and that history to help other groups. And I know that's something Tom that you're venturing into as well as Ora Newland, who's um, coming on to the panel soon to talk about her, her history. Right. So this is a great segue. So let's uh, invite Darrow and Ora to join us on screen. And uh, we can start talking about some of these issues. So, so here's uh, Daryl and Aura. And yeah, so Daryl, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to, you know, introduce you, ask you a question, and then we'll go to Aura. Uh, but uh, you know, Daryl uh, Kunitomi has worked for the Los Angeles Times for 40 years in the communications department, and um, and, and I love this part. And he's also a member of the Grateful Crane Theater Ensemble. Uh, so I'm such a big fan of of, of that ensemble which is a group, it's a theater group that focuses on Japanese American stories. Uh, Daryl's father, Jack, was a sports editor of the Heart Mountain Sentinel and a member of the Military Intelligence Service. Uh, his aunt, Sue Kunitomi Embry, another one of my heroes, was a leader of the Manzanar Pilgrimages and the Manzanar Committee. Uh, and your uncle, Ted Fujioka, was the first student body president of, Mount, of the Heart Mountain you know, High School who died in France while serving as a member of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Daryl's older brother, Dale, was born at Heart Mountain. So, so Daryl, you have this incredibly rich background working in the media as an actor and having a strong connection to Japanese American history through your parents, aunts, and uncles. You're, you're also an LA person, which you know, to many of us, um, LA is you know, not not only a hub, it's probably the hub of, of, of you know, Japanese American culture. So, you know, I guess as a, as a question, can you tell me a story or give me an example 
of something you think is important for people to remember about the World War II incarceration? Uh, that it, uh, thank you, thank you for that setup. Uh, that it was a huge wrenching event for our community. And there were, there were winners and losers and, and indifferent people that came out of it. And it affected a lot of people very deeply. Some people at a very young age had to make a decision when the government issued a loyalty questionnaire, which was poorly worded, and you're behind barbed wire and you are faced with a couple of bad questions that question your loyalty and your loyalty to the emperor, what? And people had to make a decision. They had to answer yes, yes to both questions and be patriotic or answer yes, no, or no, yes, or no, no, the worst answer you could give. And then you were vilified and you were incarcerated for a second time, removed to the infamous Thule Lake camp up in Northern Cal. So these things sat in the community's consciousness long after the war and even to this very day, there's still a bit of animosity out there from my generation, the third generation. Um, yeah, and, and Daryl, just let me, you know, for, for some of our viewers who may not know Japanese American history. So what Daryl's talking about is, well, the Japanese Americans were in camp. It was um, a, you know, what we call the loyalty questionnaire. And the US government um, in their very ham-handed way tried to figure out who in the community was loyal and disloyal. And, and this created incredible amounts of friction within the community that Daryl was talking about. So I just want to give a little bit of that background there. So keep yeah. going. So uh, one, uh, one example of one person in this gigantic story was our uncle Ted Fujioka, who was the student body president of Heart Mountain High, tall, good looking, great kid, a golden boy out of the whole family of 10 kids, the Fujioka clan. And when he graduated high school, he sat down his buddy Al Saijo outside of camp. And Al talks about this in the actual Heart Mountain Sentinel coverage, that Ted was a serious guy and I could tell he was gonna tell me something. And Ted just simply said, I'm gonna volunteer. So here's this 18 year old guy behind Bob Wire saying, I'm going to volunteer. And the reason why it's because I want to provide a place for my family in post-war America. So Ted Fujioka goes off. He's kind of a skinny guy and the army actually does him well. He puts on weight, he puts on muscle. He comes back to Harp Mountain, takes this incredible photo there with the wasteland behind him and the family never sees him again. He's killed in battle in France. He's buried in France to this day. So our family was terribly affected by that because Ted was the kind of guy who would have been one of those post-war leaders like a, a Floyd Morey or a, a Judge Uno or any of the others who became doctors, lawyers, journalists. So it was a terrible loss to the family, terrible loss to his brothers and sisters. In fact, his younger brother, Babe Fujioka, and he got that title because he was a good athlete so you always called somebody like that, babe. He was terribly affected. He couldn't talk about Uncle Ted, his older brother. And his family, I think, uh, felt that pressure to succeed and do well in life. And something our family always said, well, what would your Uncle Ted do? Something like that. Like, you should do like him. You should do well like him. You should take your younger brother under your shoulder and take care of him as Uncle Ted did. I got that from my mom. So yeah, there was that pressure that came from the family story and there was an effect on the Sansei generation. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you told that story, you know, it resonated with me because in a similar way, um, you know, my mother's uh, brother was killed in action. So he was with the 100th Battalion the 442nd also. So I know how difficult that is in terms of you know, breaking up the, uh, you know, the family. Yeah. You're, you're also, and I, I didn't mention, you, you either were or you still are 
a board member of Heart Mountain. And, and as part of that, you know, there's that other side too. You mentioned, you know, Tak Hoshizaki earlier, you know, the, the draft resistance. And so there was this, as you mentioned, this, this uh, not only the loyal questionnaire, but the, you know, the division that happened when some men volunteered to fight and some men resisted the draft and, and the tensions there too. Yeah, and I, like I said, I think it's still with us and it may never be a settled question in the community. And I feel like Heart Mountain and the whole camp experience is around me all the time. Here's this photo here behind me, folks, is not too far from Heart Mountain, near a small town named Nititsi, Wyoming, where Butch Cassidy hung out. And I saw this on the way to go fishing at the Wood River. And I can only spot barracks. And people took these barracks after the war. They paid some money for them. Veterans got preference. And they made them into homes and garages and chicken coops and barns. And they're still littering the landscape around all the camps. So even when I'm trying to relax and get out to the great outdoors, something from the past is tapping me on the shoulder saying, hey, look, here I am. Yeah, well, that's, that's great because you have such a knowledge of history to inform you know, your knowledge. And then probably as an actor, it all comes together. That's, that's powerful. I'm so I'm gonna, now oh, I'm gonna actually switch back. We'll come back to you there, but I wanna go get the aura because yes. um, yeah, uh, it's, you know, it, it's great to see you, Aura. Uh, you know, so Aura uh, Newland is an assistant prof professor of anthropology and sociology at Northwest College in Powell, Wyoming. A fourth generation Wyomingite and fourth generation Japanese American, her heritage involves intertwined stories of imprisonment at Heart Mountain, Tule Lake, and Manzanar, racially segregated military service, and hardship suffered by Wyoming railroaders who were fired because of their Japanese ancestry. Along with serving as secretary of the Heart Mountain Board, Aura is a board member of the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts and a National Steering Committee member for Tsudu for Solidarity. As a teacher, Aura is dedicated to instilling in her students a heightened capacity for compassion and empathy towards those who are different from them. So Aura, you know, so here's my question, and you know, we 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 know each other from Sudo for Solidarity and, and other places, but you know, you are a professor of anthropology and sociology, as well as an educator. You you know have this rich connection to Japanese American history through your family, and experiences as an activist connecting the Japanese American history to some of the injustices we see today. Can you tell me a story or give me an example of something you think is important for people to remember? Sure, thank you, Tom. It's wonderful to see you even in our Zoom boxes. It makes me really happy to see you along with Daryl and Shirley. Um, sure, I guess both in my, uh, my teaching life and also the work that I do with Heart Mountain connecting with my Japanese American heritage is all of that work I think is really inspired by a passion that Shirley had mentioned that is not so much about reflecting inward uh, on my Japanese American ancestry, but actually projecting that outward and uh, making connections with um, people who do not share my history. Um, as a teacher, I try to do that with my students who are on the whole, it's a mostly white uh, community that I serve here. Um, the, the student body that we have here at my community college. Um, and I teach them about race and I teach them about ethnic relations. And um, I think one of the things that um, we've been seeing recently uh, in racial justice movements across the country is something beautiful happening when people of you know, one group are standing up for people of another group that's not their own. It's not like we're fighting for our own selves, for our own survival. We're fighting for somebody else's survival. Um, I have a couple of powerful examples of that from my own family history. One of them is my great uncle Clarence, who features prominently in Shirley's book. Uh, Clarence Matsumura was um, actually born in Wyoming, then moved to California with his family before the war. Um, and then they ended up back in Wyoming at Heart Mountain. Um, 
Daryl had talked about how his uncle had volunteered and Shirley talked about Tak Hoshizaki who resisted the draft. My great uncle Clarence was drafted and he joined the, the army. Um, and he ended up being part of a segment of Japanese American soldiers who liberated one of the sub camps of Dachau. So his role while his family was still incarcerated at Heart Mountain, he was um, liberating Jewish prisoners uh, in Europe. So that example of somebody, you know, sacrificing their own, you know, life and well-being for the benefit of somebody else is powerful there. Also in my own family, my grandmother um, did not get incarcerated at Heart Mountain. All of her siblings and her parents did, but she did not because a white family on the coast in Los Angeles um, kind of helped her escape, essentially. They helped her get out of California when she wasn't supposed to, uh, but instead of going to camp, she went further inland. Um, and that was because a white family stepped up and said, we're not letting them take you away. So these are models that I've had for myself. And then with Heart Mountain, I've come to work with people like Eric Muller, who is the descendant of Holocaust survivors himself, but has dedicated his life to like building our museum at Heart Mountain and being one of the foremost scholars on Japanese American history. Um, Shirley and I work with this group of judges that you'd met the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts, uh, mostly judges of color from all over the country who were willing to come all the way to Heart Mountain to have their annual conference. And like Shirley said, it's not very easy to get here, but it meant enough to them to learn about Japanese American history to come here. Um, and so to come around to your question um, in, in terms of how I leverage that in addition to my teaching, helping my white students um, feel empathy toward people who are not like them. Uh, Tom, you and I shared a powerful experience in Fort Sill, Oklahoma about a year and a half ago by now where um, we went uh, sort of on the drop of a hat down to Oklahoma as Japanese Americans to um, stand up for the rights of migrant children um, who are going to be incarcerated uh, at Fort Sill, which is, a, which is a place where Native Americans have been incarcerated and also Japanese Americans. So for me, it's been um, really powerful to connect cross-racially and to heal that way, in addition to finding community that's provided through you know, the work that Daryl and Shirley do within the Japanese American community. Mm -hmm. Great, Ora. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, you know, and this is to the audience. I, I wanted to start off so that you would get a sense of um, Shirley, Daryl, and Aura. I mean, we have three people who you know, um, have very different backgrounds. You know, Shirley, um, you know, the Beltway, DC lawyer, Darrow in Los Angeles, um, you know, very much connected to the Japanese American community there. You have Aura in Wyoming. And, um, you know, there's a, a topic that, you know, Shirley, you kind of talk a lot about and write about, and that's the trauma. Um, you know, none of us were incarcerated during World War II, yet all of us feel a sense of trauma and are passionate about remembering and sharing the stories. You know, I guess the question, let me start with you, Shirley, first is, why do you think this is? Why do you think we're so passionate, even though we didn't experience the actual incarceration? Well, that, that's a really good question. And I think I'll answer that by responding uh, to Stan Shikuma, uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues out there. And he did ask, what is your understanding of your mother's motivation in wanting her code in to go to Heart Mountain? And why did she never talk about it with you? And I think that what happens is, is that when you know that something bad instinctively happened to your parents, your mother and father, and you love them so much, and you love your grandparents so much, and they don't talk about it with you, I think that the shock of learning it, probably at the worst possible time, which is on your deathbed, really opens up and, and it's almost a physical change in your orientation if you've got the chip for caring and, and really wanting to know more about your history. So when, even though I think that we haven't been incarcerated, I know that a lot of times when I'm talking very quickly, I said, yeah, and when we were in Hurt Mountain and I'm like, wait a minute, I was in Hurt Mountain, but I feel like I have been there. I really feel like I've been, I was with them. And so um, in answer to your question, I, I guess that was a little bit of tangent, but I want to answer Stan's, Stan's question. 
I think one of it is, is that either you kind of get it or you don't. And I do think that there is some sort of physical chemical reaction that occurs that inspires you and motivates you to have a very different approach to this issue. And so my passion is driven by history that I had to learn about. And, um, and a lot of my realization of that intergenerational trauma really was through my work with Heart Mountain and, and talking a lot with Daryl Kunatome about his own family experiences and how he reacted to it. And as I say in the, um, in the final chapter of my book, there are other Sansei daughters like me. I'm not alone. And um, it took me to get to know Daryl really well as a Sansei son. And we have a lot of similarities in terms of how we are affected by the incarceration. And so a follow-up question for you, Shirley. Um, so it, was that one of your hopes for the book to, um, you know, to sort of share, by sharing your experiences, to sort of activate, you know, some of those feelings that you just mentioned. You know, you mentioned this you know, almost chemical, emotional, you know, all these other factors, this essence that connected you to make you passionate. Um, is that sort of kind of what you're, you're trying to do by sharing with the book? Yeah, I think I wanted to really force this issue to the forefront of everyone's minds, not only if you're Japanese American, Yonsei, Gosei, et cetera, or even Asansei or Nisei, to really feel, give, your, give people permission to feel and express. The other thing I really wanted to do, honestly, was also have my African American and white colleagues understand that I actually have a history and I'm not just Shirley Higuchi, that Asian lawyer chick in Washington, DC, because I've talked to judges and lawyers in DC. Some of those own, the, the, very, the judges who protect constitutional rights, many of them don't know much about the incarceration because the government's plan worked. The government's plan worked. They kept this a secret as well. So it's not just Setsuko's secret, it's really our secret. And that's why Densho and why Heart Mountain are really important. Okay, thank you. You know, Daryl or Aura, do you have, uh, do you want to answer that question too in terms of um, why either one of you feels so passionate, uh, you know, um, even though you weren't incarcerated? I'm the youngest. So since I'm Japanese American, I'm going to defer to those who. <laughs> My elders, so Daryl, you go first. <laughs> oh, thank you. I remember the Beatles, but anyway. <clears throat> um, from a Sanse male perspective from the big city of Los Angeles where most Japanese Americans live, lived after World War II and having been a veteran of the famous Sanse dances where all these young baby boomer sanseis gathered and cha cha and danced to Motown and other songs. And there was a lot of, oh, look at her from the West Side. I better not hit on her because I'm from the East Side. It was very much like West Side Story translated into the Japanese American community. And at all of these gatherings, there were fights. And it was seen as kind of a normal thing. The lifted 57 Chevys, the pompadour front, the black windbreaker, velour shoes, mini skirts, fringe jackets. That was all part of the scene and fights. And it took me decades to, to come to the realization of and, the, and an understanding as to why all these Japanese American guys had so much violence inside of them. There were normal, regular, middle-class guys. And most of them were going to college. Some of them didn't, but they were not dumb guys. And they would go off into the parking lot and have these fights. I think it was part of the post-traumatic stress of the internment. You mix the Japanese American reticence and that kind of shyness in big social groups you mix in alcohol and whatever substances were around in the late 60s. Then you get the classism, rich kids from the west side, gardeners, sons and daughters from the east side, kids from the middle of LA who could have gone either way. And you put them together in this big party atmosphere. The hormones are going, girls are watching, and guys would fight. Now, maybe today, after a marriage or two, after a kid or three, 
maybe they're hitting retirement and they look back at those days and they go, I was a crazy dude in those days. I don't know what I was doing, but I was beefing it with guys left and right at every dance. I think it, it's an unspoken thing that we carried way too much from our parents mm -hmm. and it came out with alcohol and a social situation mm -hmm. and guys were famous for fighting. Right. And so you think, you know, part of that was not just a, you know, generational thing of the times, but there was an additional stress, additional trauma that, that yeah, triggered that. Anybody who remember, remembers the late 60s remember, remembers how violent that era was. Cops and protesters, National Guard and protesters, Kent State, Chicago Democratic Convention, the Panthers, J. Edgar Hoover. It was a wild, violent time in domestic American politics. Yeah. And I think we were a subset of that time. Darrow, as you were talking, it reminded me of, you know, I've done about 250 oral histories of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated. And especially Japanese Americans who um, um, weren't from Los Angeles and went to places like Heart Mountain or Manzanar. Um, there's always the stories about the LA guys and how rough and tumble they were uh, compared to some of the other locales. And so there, there also might be a LA thing going on too, just just uh, oh, yeah. a little side note. <laughs> but, well, but, you know, you guys from San Francisco, Seattle, Sacramento, you were guys from small towns. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we didn't, we didn't have the zoot suits and all that that the other right. guys did. So, <laughs> so let's go to Aura. And, and or if you want to comment from an anthropological or sociological standpoint about Los Angeles, that, you know, feel free to do it. But, but your, your comment about the trauma and, and what you feel. Well, what Shirley had said earlier about um, needing permission to feel and express, that I think is how intergenerational trauma has um, manifest itself in me for sure. I can really resonate with that. I, um, I have never been good at um, expressing negative emotion. I'm really good at you know expressing positive emotion, but I, I feel like I've always needed permission in order to feel. Um, and I see that as something that has really crippled me um, emotionally. And again, it's only been in the last couple of years due in large part to this work that um, Sudu for Solidarity is doing, this um, group that Tom and I are involved with and Shirley, actually all four of us are involved <laughs> with this group uh, that is um, standing on the shoulders of our Japanese American ancestors who were incarcerated in order to advocate for um, other folks who are facing race-based incarceration today. It's been through that work that I have actually been able to open up and, and tap into my emotional side. Um, and I know that Tom and I both experienced this as like having just big outpours of, you know, tears after, um, after engaging in action on behalf of other people. And I'm, it's something that I'm still working on. I'm not good at expressing negative emotion, but it feels good to um, to start working toward that. I'm healing from a trauma that I didn't even know that I had, I think. So I'm yeah. working on it. I, I mean, just to emphasize that point, yeah, after Fort Sill, when I came back to Seattle and you know, just the enormity of what we had just experienced, um, you know, I was with my wife and you know, I, I broke down the sobs that she had never seen me express before. And and what I recognized was it, it was like this intergenerational trauma. There was more than what I experienced, but it felt like pretty much what, what our community had experienced was just coming out as, as we you know, saw these, these children, you know, the threat of these children being placed in these, these camps. So yeah, very powerful. Um, you all, I'm, I'm now kind of pivoting to some of the questions that the audience is asking. And there's one for you, Shirley, you know, there's a, and I remember this uh, vividly, I think we all do, uh, in terms of your role, and you write about this in the book, about the fight for the Eaton collection. So this was a, a collection that was uh, in danger of being dispersed, of actually being auctioned off. Can you talk about why it was so important to keep that collection together and preserved? Well, actually, I think that question really ties, Tom, to what you and Aura had just talked about, that here, you know, both of you are doing really great work in the community. And then you go to Fort Sill and the, the impact of that. And then you 
you you guys all had an emotional reaction to it. I believe Tom, if you if what you just said about yourself breaking down and crying, I believe that you were crying for more than those children at Fort Sill. I think you were crying for your family's experiences and all the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into Den Show and realizing that you were probably pretty stoic during that whole process, like I was stoic with Heart Mountain. And you realize like, it's really also about you, you know, your feelings and your family's feelings and what happened to your parents. So anyways, and I think that is tied to the Eaton collection. I mean, I, I didn't know anything about Eaton. You know, I never cared about public auctions and I was getting pressure to support the auction and actually go to the auction and bid on some art. I didn't know, I was still a little bit of that Japanese American dummy. I didn't know what to do. But it was this, reading these articles in the New York Times, and then it, something sort of like really clicked in my head. It's like, wait a minute, this artwork was built on the backs of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated illegally at a, at a site. And in like Indian art that's made, made on sacred ground, that artwork really needed to be back at Heart Mountain and back in the community. I mean, I really wanted the artwork displayed at Heart Mountain that was created there. For God's sakes, if Estelle Ishigo wanted her ashes, which is in my book, scattered on Heart Mountain by Bacon Sakatani, don't you think she'd want her artwork there too? I mean, it's not really a big leap. So it was really at that moment that um, where my Beltway experience and my work in Washington DC made a difference. I worked with a New Jersey law firm and I was able to quickly pick up the phone and we began researching the legal theory that the Japanese American incarceration experience, the incarcerees entrusted that work to Eaton. It wasn't, it wasn't an illegal conveyance, it was a conditional gift. In other words, we will give you this artwork if you promise you will display it. Well, that never happened, right? The artwork ended up in the basement of some next door neighbor that now gave it away in a public auction. And that individual, Thomas Ryan, had no relation to Eaton, no relation to that artwork. And so it was on that legal theory that Heart Mountain hired that law firm and uh, prepared the injunction papers. And, and after we gave notice to the uh, auction um, people, they canceled the auction that night. So, and we also had work from the community. Um, I, um, everyone knows the work that the Facebook page and the social media, as you know, it takes a village, but between the social media and the community, we were able to, um, you know, stop it with legal threat. You know, legal, legal skills come in handy when people are treating you unfairly. And I wish we had that in 1942. Thank you. Yeah, you know, when I read the book, you know, one of the, um, the things you do is you, it's like you intertwine the stories from different families. And so I'm curious, I mean, I have the three of you um, and each of you have these stories that, um, you know, are part of the Heart Mountain story. And so I, I'm curious, did, did, you know, Shirley, when you wrote the book, did you know these stories before you knew Daryl and Aura? Or was it because you met, you know, these people on the board and through your journey that you learned about how all the stories were intertwined. I'm, I'm curious because very much your book is that. It's, 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 it's not just one person's story, but you set it up so that you're bringing in all these stories and how they, they all kind of mix together. Well, I think in terms of being able to actually tell the story of the Kunatomis and the Fujiokas and Ted in particular, and the Matsumura Sunata family through Aura Newland, I had to really talk to Daryl and Aura. I mean, you know, because you sometimes you hear things and you read things, you go, hey, did, you know, but really it's when you have a live body in front of you that you're actually meeting with on a regular basis throughout the year to really shed some light and some specificity to the experience. And it really meant a lot to me to be able to connect with Daryl and his family and Aura and her mother and her family. I mean, like it kind of gives you a higher sense of authority and purpose when you actually meet family members that knew the people that you're writing about. I, I mean, I guess that is so, I guess it was really through Daryl and Aura's family that I got to know know the stories better. Great. So I'm, I'm gonna, you know, Aura, I have a question for you. Um, you know, speaking about the Heart Mountain pilgrimage 
and also the visitor center and its programs. And the reason I'm asking you is because you're from Wyoming and it's, it's almost like a question of the future um, of keeping the story alive and the importances of pilgrimages and the, the sense of sight and having interpretive centers there. I mean, talk a little bit about the importance of those things. And, and, and we might have to draw Shirley in, but um, are there plans for you know, a pilgrimage and things like that uh, in the coming year? Sure, so um, thank you for the question. And when uh, Tom mentions the concept of a pilgrimage, um, Heart Mountain has been having pilgrimages back to the site uh, for, I don't know, a couple of decades now, maybe longer. Um, and other sites, uh, Manzanar, other, other sites have increasingly um, had annual pilgrimages um, that were initially for former incarcerees and their descendants to come to the site where they were incarcerated and to find healing and to reconnect with their friends and uh, find community and um, just take back some of that experience for themselves, I think. Um, they have expanded to also invite the local community in to learn about this history that happened here. Um, and as as sad as something like that sounds, they're actually like really raucous and fun and a way to make friends and join with family. So um, that's how that's how I became involved with Heart Mountain. Um, and there's something, I mean, we could do this. There are Heart Mountain reunions and things that they have in Los Angeles and Las Vegas for folks to get together who knew each other at camp and they can get together in their, uh, you know, near where they live. But to come back to the site is really powerful. And another thing that inspires me to give myself permission to cry sometimes is being able to see like 90 year old men shed tears for the first time when they're back on the site and the tears that they're shedding are not for themselves, but for, you know, one man was talking about how shameful it must have been for his mother to use a restroom with no partitions at camp. And after all these years, this is what brought him to tears, to be on site and to think of the shame that his mother experienced. And um, so there's something about the power of place and coming back here that helps people heal and remember and move forward. It's a very forward looking um, institution that we have, the museum, and maybe Shirley could talk about what we uh, have in mind with the Mineta Simpson Institute and where we're moving forward. Yeah, be before we do that, um, I actually wanna to go to uh, Daryl and build off something that you just talked about. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the importance of feelings in terms of, of understanding, you know, what happened. And, and Daryl, as an actor, you have to very much deal with feelings. And we actually opened the program with that beautiful trailer where you had incredible you know, artwork and animations and music uh, from Kishibashi. And, and I think about the importance of arts to you know, really allow people to emote, you know, to have these feelings. So the, the question for you is, I guess, you know, you are you know, with the Grateful Crane where you know, that's part of you know, your mission is to you know, tell the stories from the community in a way that people can feel it. I mean, talk uh, about that a little bit. Yeah, in terms of the importance of that. It's almost yeah, like that other essence. You know, a lot of times Japanese Americans, I think of them as, as being very analytical, but there's this other side that is really, really important. My old uh, acting sensei, Nobu McCarthy, the lead character in Farewell to Manzanar, once described the, the Japanese character's emotions. Oh, we keep it inside. And then when it comes out, it's like volcano. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of a, a, a funny little take on it, but it's kind of true. We, Woody Allen says, well, you know, as a Jew, I, I keep it inside and grow a tumor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we tend to withhold it. We tend to hold it in. We don't want to be shameful in our behavior. We don't want to impose on others. And boy, it's ugly when we start letting go and cry. Oh, but you know, it's totally healthy to do that. And for a group of people whose parents and grandparents went through the worst constitutional violation of rights in the American, the history of the Americas, 
And right at this point, it happens all the time, somebody will say, well, you know, Japan treated their prisoners horribly. You know, Japan started World War II. They attacked Pearl Harbor. They committed the Bataan atrocity, Unit 731, the rape of Nanking. And I have to say that was them. That was not us here in America. Don't confuse the Japanese military with your gardener down the street or the fisherman down the block, the reverend at the Buddhist temple or the judo instructor. That wasn't us. We were living a good American life and all that crap got put on us. And unfortunately, the great Democrat FDR signed the whole matter over to the army and the constitution flew out the window. So I think the lesson now, guys, is that in times of stress, the Constitution, mighty as it is, has to remain as strong as possible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in reference to others being incarcerated right now, like kids, that is an absolute American atrocity. Well, the one thing I do want to is follow up and address what the point that Aura brought up was, I think one of the challenges as a nation that we have and that we could be very helpful on is educating, as Daryl said, about the constitutional violations in 1942 and using it as a teaching tool on how to treat people today, especially children and family members who are being separated. But I think another issue that's really coming to the front that I think Japanese Americans can be very helpful with, and we're doing this at Heart Mountain, is establishing the Mineta Simpson Institute. And as people know, you know, Secretary Mineta, um, a renowned Democrat, Alan Simpson, renowned Republican, they have worked together on a variety of issues, including supporting Heart Mountain as well as the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium work. So um, I think in terms of moving ahead in healing, that is something that I think we can really get young people involved in. And I really think the young people by learning about their parents and grandparents experience and also looking to the future to how to help others is a place that we can work together uh, to have a more unified community. So I sort of say for the future, young people get on Densho, visit Heart Mountain, get on our website, learn more, talk to your parents and grandparents, talk to Daryl, couldn't tell me. I mean, he obviously has tons of stories and take that experience and make good out of it as part of our healing process. Great, thank you so much for those words, Shirley.